uh, it's, uh, it should be understood to be a real war. And it's not a new war, it's an old war. Uh, furthermore, it's a perfectly conscious war uh, everywhere, but specifically in the United States where there happens to be a very free country, but it happens to have a highly class conscious business class and always has. And it's very free and open, so you have a lot of information about it. They talk, you have their records. And they have long seen themselves as fighting a bitter class war, except they don't want anybody else to know about it. Occasionally, someone else gets the news. A uh, rather famous case, which I'm sure you know, was uh, Doug Fraser about 20 years ago, 1978, I think, when he uh, pulled out of the Labor Management Council and condemned business leaders for, words were roughly like this, for having decided to fight a one-sided class war against working people, uh, the poor, the unemployed, minorities, uh, uh, even members of the middle class, and for having uh, torn up the fragile social compact that had been achieved during periods of growth and prosperity, in fact, had been achieved, although he didn't say this, primarily through rather militant struggle, very militant struggle under harsh conditions uh, back in the 1930s. Uh, now, the only thing wrong with his statement is that it was way too late. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, that war that he's talking about uh, was initiated as soon as the fragile social compact was established back in the 1930s and very openly. Uh, there's no, if you, it's, you don't have to go to secret records to find out about it, uh, nor do you have to have been at the wrong end of the clubs when the strikes were broken up in the late 30s to know about it. It was completely public. Uh, the reason it's not well known is because uh, neither the educational system nor scholarship like Harvard and so on uh, pay any attention to it. It's not a topic that's studied. So w there's no doubt that one of the major issues of 20th century history, surely in the United States, uh, is corporate propaganda. Uh, that's a huge industry. Uh, in fact, it, uh, it extends over the, obviously, the commercial media, but the, uh, the whole range of uh, uh, systems that reach the public, the entertainment industry, uh, uh, television, uh, a good bit of what appears in the schools, a lot of what appears straight out in the newspapers and so on huge amount of that comes straight out of uh, the public relations industry, which was established in this country early in the century and then sort of developed mainly in the 20s and on, and has become an enormous industry. It's now spreading over the rest of the world, but it's primarily here. Uh, and its goal from the beginning, perfectly openly and consciously, was to uh, control the public mind, as they put it. And the reason was that the public mind was seen as the greatest threat to corporations. Uh, that's from early in the century. Uh, business power was strong, but it's a very free country by comparative standards, and it's hard to call on state violence, not impossible, but hard to call upon state violence to crush uh, people's efforts to achieve freedom and uh, rights and justice. So therefore, it was recognized early on that it's going to be necessary to control people's minds. I should say that's not a new insight either. You know, you can read it in David Hume and the Enlightenment where it was already recognized. In fact, you go back to the earliest stirrings of democratic revolutions in England in the uh, 17th century, and there already was concern that we're not going to be able to control people by force, and we therefore have to control them by other means, controlling what they think, what they feel, their attitudes, their attitudes toward one another. I mean, all sorts of mechanisms of control are going to have to be devised. Uh, which will replace uh, the efficient use of force and violence that was available to a much greater extent earlier on, uh, and as has been fortunately declining, you know, not uniformly, but often declining through the years, particularly here, leading to the need for other methods of uh, uh, control. Uh, you don't have to move very far from the Cambridge elite to learn about it. The major, the leading figure of the public relations industry is a highly regarded uh, Cambridge liberal, you know, Roosevelt Kennedy liberal, died recently, uh, Edward Bernays. 
uh, who wrote the standard manual of the public relations industry back in the 1920s, which is very much worth reading. Uh, remember, I'm not talking about the right wing here. This is way at the left liberal end of American politics. Uh, his uh, book, it's called On Propaganda, or maybe just propaganda. Uh, I should mention that terminology changed during the Second World War. Prior to the Second World War, the term propaganda was used quite openly and freely for controlling the public mind. It got bad connotations during the Second World War because of you know, Hitler and that sort of thing. So the term was dropped, and now there's other terms used. Uh, but if you read the literature in the social sciences and the public relations industry and so on back in the, say, 20s and the 30s, they describe what they're doing as propaganda. This manual is for the rising public relations industry. And he opens by pointing out that the uh, conscious manipulation of the organized habits and opinions of the masses uh, is uh, the central is the essential feature of a democratic society. It's the essence of democracy, as he later pointed out. Uh, and he said, we have the means to carry this out now. Uh, he said, we have the means to regiment people's minds as efficiently as armies regiment their bodies. And we must do this. First of all, it's the essential feature of democracy, but also sort of footnote, uh, it's the way to maintain power structures and authority structures and wealth and so on, roughly the way it is. It's worth remembering something else that they usually don't teach you very much about in school. Uh, and that is, if you go back to the origins of American society, it was founded on the principle that was stated very explicitly by the leading framer, James Madison, at the Constitutional Conventions, uh, that uh, the, uh, as he put it, the primary responsibility of government is to protect the minority of the opulent against the majority. Uh, and Madison recognized, uh, he's a smart guy, that this was going to be a serious problem uh, if a democratic system were established. Uh, it was going to, uh, if people had the right to vote, he, he used England as his model. Uh, England was the model for democracy in those days, right? It's like, I'm talking about the 1780s. And he pointed out in the debates on the Constitutional Convention, something which everybody ought to read in third grade in a free society. I mean, this is the origins of our society. You know. He pointed out that uh, in England, if they had the right to vote, which fortunately they didn't, uh, he said pretty soon you would find people uh, calling for redistribution of property and for attacks on property rights for what nowadays we'd call agrarian reform. It was mostly an agricultural society. He didn't use the term agrarian reform, but same thing. He said, people will start calling for agrarian reform. Obviously, that's intolerable. And we have to protect our own society against that kind of injustice uh, by, protect, by ensuring that the rights of property prevail. Uh, he recognized that, he said it's a problem now. He was already concerned in the 1780s by what he called symptoms of a leveling spirit. That is, people are trying to, you know, feel that property ought to be more equitably distributed. That's a danger. But he said that the danger is going to become much more severe over time uh, as more and more people uh, are marginalized and dispossessed and secretly yearn for a more uh, equal distribution of life's blessings. Now, if those people get the vote, we're going to be in trouble because it's going to be hard to protect the minority of the opulent against the majority, which is what government's all about. And he therefore designed the constitutional system, uh, which was uh, intended to prevent that danger. Uh, the uh, system, uh, the way he set it up, uh, he and the other framers, because it was virtually unanimous, and there was virtually no disagreement about this. Uh, the, the one person who might have disagreed, Jefferson, was not part of any of this stuff. Uh, the, uh, he, um, the constitutional system as he designed it was supposed to put power in the hands of the wealthy who are the more capable set of men, I'm quoting. Uh, power must reside in the hands of the wealthy, the more capable set of men, with the general population fragmented, factionalized, dispersed, uh, you know, in conflict and so on and so forth. Well, this is like, we're now 1780s. Okay, it's 
been a pretty stable system. Uh, and as it's been harder, as the franchise has increased. So over time, more and more people did get the right to vote. Uh, and that just raised the danger. Furthermore, the, the power of the state to coerce by violence, uh, by this, and that includes the power of private power, like the power of, say, Carnegie to hire Pinkertons and so on, uh, as that has declined, the need to resort to these other me measures of factionalization, uh, uh, instilling hatred, uh, marginalizing people, uh, straight propaganda, and so on, that's increased, and very consciously. So by the time you get to the 1920s, where I started from, uh, it's recognized that uh, huge resources must go into uh, the conscious uh, manipulation of the organized habits and opinions of the masses, and we have to regiment them their minds as well as an army regiments their bodies, and we have the met methods for it, and those methods are advertising, um, entertainment, uh, straight propaganda in the media, schools, so on and so forth. Uh, the 20s was an important period in this regard. Uh, it looks as if labor is under attack now, but remember in the 20s it had been smashed. Uh, the major uh, American historian of labor historian, David Montgomery, has a book which you probably know or should if you don't, called The, Hall, the Fall of the House of Labor, very you know, sort of standards, important book on the history of the labor movement. It ends in the 1920s because that's when the House of Labor had fallen uh, and uh, after, uh, with a lot of violence in that case, state violence, Wilson's Red Scare, the leading labor leader was in jail, Eugene Debs, where the New York Times had said years ago he ought to be sent and so on. It was, th there'd been a big strike wave in the, during the, at the end of the First World War, smashed, uh, labor movement destroyed, uh, the whole thing wiped out. As Montgomery points out at the end of his book, uh, labor had been virtually destroyed. Uh, working people had to uh, privatize their lives and aspirations. They sort of work out survival strategies for themselves, not with others, because the modes of cooperation and common struggle had been eliminated. And they did it, he ends up by saying, in a, in a most undemocratic America, which is true. It was a highly undemocratic country uh, using a combination of modes of violence and coercion and repression and increasingly propaganda to prevent the dangers that Madison was worrying about you know, almost 200 years earlier, uh, that more and more people would uh, secretly sigh for a better uh, better access to life's blessings and might even do something about it if they had a functioning democracy which therefore couldn't be permitted. 